Well, the journey started as uh, in many people in my generation. It started in rock and roll and in Belgrade urban culture. And you know, being a young person in Belgrade in the 80s, me being attached to the idea of the rebellion and not you know not responding to the system. And we were living a decent middle life, uh, a middle class life. And then this crazy guy Milosevic came in. He changed the environment. He started pushing us to wars with our neighbors. So majority of my generation was involved in social activism from the very early stage. 1992, we were involved in the first student protest. 96, 97, we were leading the students' protests already. 1998, we formed Otpor. So it was more a necessity and defense of the common sense than really a political activism or courage. Uh, courage. Being involved in politics in Serbia in my age was a conscious choice of middle class urban young men. Cool. Since the Serbian revolution in, in 2000 and since the Kamas, my organization is, is formed, and especially since the movie Bringing Down Dictator was out and translated into 15 different languages, activists kind of uh, come to us. We never chase them, they address us, and they're coming from different countries. They either come through email, sometimes they come through the Facebook page, so it's just the technique. They often come through the other activists they know because now we have a very decent activist network. Our policy is to work with young people committed to nonviolence or older people committed to nonviolence. And our only, our only uh, decision whether or not to work is we check on the group and if we decide that the group is committed to nonviolence we try to say yes and then we try to meet them and we try to organize the workshop. We send them the materials. In our history it happened two or three times that we had to refuse down the group who addressed us because through our contacts in the country we were not sure if the group is committed to the non-violence. So if the group is committed to the non-violence, we don't care if this is a student group, political party, youth group, a group of retired people or an environmental organization. If they want to build up the movement, if they want to, to uh, face the injustice, if they want to build numbers, and if they want to do it through the non-violent way, we often say yes. Since Gandhi and Martin Luther King and Lech Walesa and Serbian Otpor, regardless of background, mentality, color of the skill and religion, all successful nonviolent movements share some things in common. Uh, first of all, they have a vision of tomorrow. They have the idea of what, if I am a king for a day, how the society will look tomorrow. Second, they rely on the three most important principles of nonviolent struggle. First one being unity, whether this is the unity of religions, unity of political parties, unity of purpose. Second one is planning. There is no such thing as a successful and spontaneous nonviolent revolution. You want a successful nonviolent revolution? You need to meticulously plan how to reach your vision of tomorrow. Third most important principle is nonviolent discipline. One single act of violence can destroy your movement and groups need to work on this nonviolent discipline. It's a skill and we try to teach people how to achieve the skill. Of course, depending on the context, every single struggle is different, so the tactics would be different, the ideas would be different, the language would be different, uh, the ways they address the, the target audiences would be different, their humor would be different, but uh, if they stick up to the three main principles of non one struggle and if they know what they want very early in process, it's more likely that the movement would be successful. Uh, however funny it may sound, one of the most powerful weapons in the arsenal of social movements throughout the last decade was humor. And it may sound funny that you use humor against you know, the tanks and the riot police, but it works very nice. There is basically three different reasons why humor works very nice in building the movement. Uh, first of all, being humor breaks fear. And if you're getting ready for a major surgery, the last thing you want to hear is your friend telling you, okay, this is how they're going to open your chest and this is what they're going to do inside. Instead of that, if your friend cracks a joke, you start laughing. However, the situation is dramatic, your fear will disappear. We're having fear and apathy being the main factors of status quo in society. Whatever breaks the fear and the apathy is useful for a nonviolent movement. Second reason, humor makes your movement being cool and in, so people want to join. And this is normal. Think about your normal life. Who's the most popular person in your environment? The richest one, the tallest one, the most beautiful one, 
or the one who can make you laugh. That's the person everybody wants to be around. So if you're a movement which is in the same time funny and edgy and making people feel really relaxed, whatever is your goal, whether you're cleaning your neighborhood from a dog's poop or you're trying to change about the autocratic government, people will like to be around you so your numbers will grow. Last but not of least importance, people in power, whether democratic elected like here in Germany or you know it's like being out across for 27, 30 years like in Zimbabwe, something happens in their head. They've seen their face too much on the TV and the billboards and the newspaper. So what happens is that they are taking themselves too seriously. So when you make a prank towards these people, they often do something stupid. So then their reaction becomes the next punchline or the next point for your strategy. This specific use of humor and combination of humor and dilemma action, which is one of the chapters of the book we call Loftivism, coming from laughter and activism. Loftivism is one of the most effective tools to challenge autocrats and people in power in the last decade. Uh, this book is a book for common people who want to change something, but still they don't have courage or they live in this illusion that it's not up to them. Uh, too often we look at the big leaders and big heroes throughout our history, we look at the big warriors sitting on the horses on our main squares, and we think, no, changing the world is not for us. Actually, when you look at the major political and social changes which happened in the world, at least in the last century, it was not done through the weapons and it was not done by the elites. It was done by common people. You know, who was Martin Luther King? He was a village priest. Who was Lech Walesa? He was the electrician in the shipyard in Gdansk. And I mean, who were we? We were a bunch of students coming from Belgrade rock bands. So, I mean, these are the people like you, these are the people like me, these are the people whom you're meeting in your neighborhood, and to refer to my favorite favorite book, Lord of the Rings, it's not the pe warriors in the shiny armors and great wizards who defeated all evil, it is hobbits. So the message of this book and the purpose of this book is to encourage the common people who can change the world and tell them, yes, it may be difficult, yes, everybody will tell you to drop off, but throughout the history it was people like you and me who changed the world. So if there is something you want to achieve, uh, try to do it. It has to be you.